Today I'm going to show you what I've found to be the easiest way to make pure potassium iodate, as well as a unique and incredibly unstable polyhalide salt that I was able to make with it. Now, technically I've made potassium iodate before on this channel by the oxidation of potassium iodide using potassium permanganate, but I found this method to be faster, cleaner, and higher yielding. I've also developed a simple purification step I hadn't thought of in my old video, which resulted in a much purer product as well. Anyway, to go ahead and get started, I first mixed together 16.6 grams of potassium iodide and 15.1 grams of sodium bromate in a stainless steel vessel. This represents a tenth of a mole of each salt, and the sodium bromate can be substituted with the sodium or potassium salts of either bromate or chlorate, as long as the proper adjustments are made to account for the differences in molar mass. Now, once these two had been thoroughly mixed, I set the steel vessel up over a Bunsen burner, and began to gently heat the salt mixture. The idea here is that iodine has more affinity for oxygen than chlorine or bromine, and so ideally when the two salts are melted together, the bromate should oxidize the iodide forming iodate and bromide. At first I expected this reaction to take a decently long time, and so while I was fiddling with the camera and lighting, the salt mixture began to violently react, which was a bit startling. Since the reaction happened all at once, and way sooner than I expected, I decided to refilm it in a test tube at a much smaller scale so you can actually see it happen. Now, like I said before, when the bromate and the iodide are melted together, they'll react to form bromide and iodate. In the test tube here, you can see that the heat from the Bunsen burner acts more as a catalyzing activation energy for what's clearly a very exothermic and easily self-sustaining reaction. This reaction also generated some iodine vapor as a byproduct, which was much more noticeable in the larger scale reaction I did first. Once the salt melt in the steel vessel had cooled down to room temperature, I next added some distilled water and began to slowly break apart and dissolve the fused salt mass. Using hot water for this step will make it far easier, as the solid mass of salt has minimal surface area and is very slow to dissolve. Once it did all eventually dissolve, I transferred the solution to a beaker and put it on a hot plate to boil. This was done to drive off some extra water and to make sure that all of the minimally soluble potassium iodate was completely dissolved. Once I had my total volume down to around 150 milliliters, I took the beaker off the heat and cooled the solution down to around 5 degrees Celsius in order to crystallize out my potassium iodate product. This was collected by vacuum filtration, transferred to a dish, and then dried completely under a day of vacuum desiccation. I then weighed the potassium iodate for a final mass of 23.15 grams, representing an impossible 108% yield, which was slightly annoying. Now, my idea here was that when potassium iodide and sodium bromate reacted, they would mostly form a mixture containing iodate, bromide, potassium, and sodium ions. This would allow the following salts to form in solution, with potassium iodate having by far the lowest solubility, and thus being very easy to crystallize out at a low temperature and then collect by filtration. However, when I did a little bit more reading to try to explain my really high percent yield, I found that the sodium salt of iodate actually has a lower solubility than the potassium salt. This is something I never even considered as a possibility since potassium salts almost always have a lower solubility than their sodium counterparts. This introduced a new problem in that my product was not potassium iodate at all, but rather sodium iodate. This consequently means that my percent yield is even higher than the initial 108%, meaning this is very impure. My working theory on this impurity is that there was a significant amount of unreacted bromate which precipitated as its potassium salt. This means I needed to figure out some way to convert my sodium iodate to potassium iodate while also getting rid of my bromate impurities, and I think you'll like what I came up with. What I came up with is pretty versatile and could be used to purify any iodate salt made either in the manner I showed in this video or in the procedure I used in my old video on potassium iodate where the iodide was oxidized using potassium permanganate. Anyway, to convert my contaminated sodium iodate to pure potassium iodate, I began by redissolving the crude crystals back into the filtrate from earlier. To this I added a solution containing 7 grams of calcium chloride dissolved in 25 milliliters of distilled water. This addition immediately began to precipitate the barely soluble calcium iodate, while any bromide, bromate, or iodide would stay dissolved. 
The calcium iodate was then collected by vacuum filtration and immediately transferred to a fresh beaker containing 300 milliliters of distilled water. To this, I added a solution containing 7 grams of potassium carbonate dissolved in 50 milliliters of water. This was allowed to continue reacting for an hour under constant stirring to assure that the reaction went to completion. What's happening here is a double displacement reaction that isn't quite as dramatic as most other similar reactions. And in fact, it isn't really apparent that anything is happening at all. Basically, the idea is that even though calcium iodate is only sparingly soluble, it does still have a solubility of around 2.5 grams per liter at room temperature. Calcium carbonate, however, only has a solubility of around 0.013 grams per liter at room temperature, giving it around half of 1% the solubility of calcium iodate. This makes the formation of calcium carbonate here very favorable, and given enough time, all of the calcium iodate and potassium carbonate will react forming soluble potassium iodate and insoluble calcium carbonate. To that end, after the two had spent an hour reacting, the insoluble calcium carbonate was filtered off, and the filtrate containing mostly pure potassium iodate was boiled down to around 100 milliliters. This was then cooled down to around 0 degrees Celsius to crystallize out the potassium iodate, which was collected by vacuum filtration, dried, and weighed for a final and more realistic mass of 20.12 grams, representing a 94% yield. This is way better than my number from earlier, and this time I'm very confident that what I had was nearly pure potassium iodate. Even though accidentally making sodium iodate is what prompted me to come up with this little procedure, it's something I'm really happy with, and something I plan to do in the future regardless of whether sodium is involved or not. Anyway, now that I had finally made some very pure potassium iodate, it was time to make my polyhalide salt. To this end, I simply added a small scoop of the potassium iodate to a test tube followed by a few milliliters of fuming 37% hydrochloric acid. This immediately resulted in a large amount of bubbling as the iodate oxidized the hydrochloric acid to chlorine and water. Alongside the chlorine gas, this reaction forms the polyhalide anion iodine tetrachloride, which imparts a bright golden color to the solution. I used a small butane lighter to make sure that all of the potassium iodate had completely dissolved, and then I allowed the solution to cool. As it cools, long thin crystals of bright yellow potassium tetrachloroiodide will begin to form. These crystals are absolutely beautiful, and their distinct yellow color can be observed directly by pouring off the excess liquid once they've finished crystallizing. I did get some decent footage of this, which I'm just going to let play for a minute. If you don't like crystals, and you'd rather just get on with the video, feel free to skip to the time shown on screen. <laughs> 
So yeah, this is my final polyhalide salt. I tried collecting these crystals by vacuum filtration and drying them out, but as it turns out, they're incredibly unstable and will quickly decompose to potassium iodide and chlorine during the drying process, which is pretty unfortunate. On that note, the addition of acetone or any organic solvent will also cause the crystals to rapidly decompose, forming a dark brown solution along with a white precipitate that's likely potassium chloride. This reaction is slightly delayed after the addition of the solvent, which I also found somewhat interesting. Anyway, that's all I have for today. I hope you found this interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my incredible patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. To everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.